introductions. So hello everyone. Uh, my name is Simo Tuomista. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm a um, can't remember the title now, but uh, probably systems designer or something like that <laughs> uh, in Alta University, where I work with uh, Aga HPC and uh, and help our users with various problems. And quite often these can be IO related. Uh, so so I'm going to talk about talk a bit about data formats and how you should store your data uh, to make your analysis easier. Yeah. It's almost funny how often we have problems that are not about, like people know how to use CPU and memory pretty well, but the data IO, that's often pretty, uh, well, not great. Anyway.
So welcome back everyone after the break. So we, I also hope that you have been working uh, with progress with exercise one, two, and three. So just yes, would like to point out that uh, there, there are good questions in HackMD and we will answer them asynchronously and uh, get back and perhaps highlight a few of them tomorrow. So now I know that some of you have been working on exercise one and two and um, exercise where you have template solutions. Um, for exercise three, it's open-ended where you could have go in different directions. And we have one worked example with the, the, the Seaborn library. And uh, is there perhaps an example exploration that we have with um, one of the other libraries, uh, rather one? Yes, so we will show now the remaining, like we have maybe seven, seven, eight minutes left. We could try it together because the exercise three is maybe the most interesting one, but probably takes more than 50 minutes. But again, I really invite you to try it out. And what we could do now just for added difficulty is that we take one, let's take one example out of Matplotlib and we, we try to adapt it a little bit and try to make sense of it. So this is how I often start. I go into, into the gallery and what I will do now, let's take, let's take this one here as an example. It shows some scores for men and women. I don't really know. But first, first thing I will, we will do is I will copy that into my notebook and I will try to run it. I just need to make that more readable. So that's how I often start, copy paste, and I will run it, shift enter. And I'm pretty happy here because I get the same result. That's already a really good step. Yes. And now the second step, before I go into any details, I, I try to make sense of the data. And the data seems to be here. So there are labels. Now let's simplify that a little bit. Now maybe, maybe I just want to have two, two values plotted. So there are five, five things in a list and I see five bars. So what happens if I remove three of them? Will that, what will happen? Probably it will still work. So, so what are these uh, data types that you have there? So these are lists, Python list. Yeah, Python list, yes. A list of integers here. Here there is a list of strings. So these are not NumPy arrays. One could also use NumPy arrays. And I run this again and I have now two columns and I could even, probably I could modify the width. And now, Let's just have a little bit more fun here. So I will call this day one and day two. And I saw that the labels changed. And instead of scores, where is scores? I want to change this thing. It's probably that one. I don't know, number of viewers. And instead of gender, let's look at, I don't know, viewers by tool and instead of men and women let's imagine we we are interested in how many people watch on twitch via later i don't know youtube as we run and it's still kind of working and now i i can imagine that this is probably the these are the bars and these will be the kind of error dv standard deviations and I don't know how many viewers we, like yesterday was probably, and I, now it's also a bit confusing because we have, mm. this is not yeah. men and women, we could rename these. We have a number for today. So currently we have 195 viewers on Twitch. So let's call this Twitch. 195. Yeah. And, and I think more, I don't know, 400. Yeah, uh, yeah well, in, yes, of, the, of that order, yes. Yeah, and now I change this, I will run it, it will not work because it will, oh, how come it works? Why does it work? 
Mm. Ah, because, well, what, I don't understand why this code is working. <laughs> because so, <laughs> I was hoping that I should need also to change this. But, yeah. oh, but you, you had this arrays in, in memory, perhaps? Yeah. All oh, right. Yeah, good point. Like, actually, let me go back because I should. One thing I should really do. Was it men? That's a very good thing. Let me show that before I finish this. This is very very good. One thing I should really do is before I save the notebook because I think actually everything is good here. It works. What I should do is I like to rerun all cells. You can even restart the kernel and rerun all cells. Let's try that because then it should really break. It will restart the whole thing and run the whole thing from top to bottom. Let's see. Restart, yes. And now we get the error. Very good. Yeah, yeah. Because now it it just doesn't find man means is undefined because I changed that. So that was really good demo demo effect. Before saving a notebook, before sharing it with other people, really good to restart, rerun all cells from top to bottom, because then this is the first thing that the next person will do. Good. I will not go more into details here. Um, but back to the lesson. Just to summarize, we have like three more minutes left. I find this really useful to do go through. Take an example that is close to what you work on right now. Also, you can try any of these other libraries. They are all great with Jupyter. Some of them are not part of Anaconda. So some of them you need an extra installation step. But also have a look at Seaborn. Just a quick peek here at the gallery. Also very nice library, which builds on top of Matplotlib. And for Seaborn, we do have uh, an example exploration that yes. we can open in the lesson. So you could go through that. And that will work also in your in your Anaconda. So that's what I often do. I take something existing. I want to tweak the data. If it looks somehow all right, then I improve the looks and ready to publish. So let's summarize here the session. It was very quick, and we only could give you some starting points. Hopefully, it was useful. Uh, some points that I would, again, like to repeat is Automation is our friend. There will be the day when we are really happy that we have everything in notebook and don't have to redo all the figures by hand. And all of them will regenerate in two minutes. Um, as Johan mentioned, keep the data and the, the thinking process and the plotting and the figures all in one place if you can. Sometimes you cannot. Example when you cannot is when the data is sensitive. Then it has to be in a different place or if the data is gigantic, then it also needs to be in a different place, but then we can fetch it with, with pandas, for instance. And on, on Thursday, we will take this even a step further because we will show how to create a binder instance from our notebook. And then we can share visualization with others and they can re reuse it and reproduce it. And they don't even have to have Jupyter and Matplotlib on the computer. All they need is a browser. So this will be very nice and we come back to that on Thursday. What did I forget to say? I could perhaps highlight one uh, thing, uh, namely this with the uh, color scales. And uh, as you can read down here, an important aspect is this, that uh, some people are perhaps uh, colorblind. And it's a, in general, it's a very good thing to uh, have a color scale that works also if you project it to a black and white color scale. And uh, this is also important for the sake of printing because sometimes you, you print things in, in black and white and then it's good if the color scale is working from the beginning. Yes, and further up in the lesson, we have some uh, links to resources that actually give you a good color or palette, which is adapted to these different color vision deficiencies. Great point. Thanks so much for watching and for listening and for the questions. And we, we will catch up with the questions. And I will we will hand over to, to Simo.
please take away the screen for me. Hello. So we're in gallery view now. Um, yeah, thanks for the talk. Um, I really liked the pandas and visualization part. I think these are sort of the most important parts of the course, like the right level of advanced and basic for most people. Um, so now on to data formats. So, Simo, why are, yeah. yeah, why are any other comments? I think not. Uh, so, it's a data, uh, screen share. Good. Uh, it will, I will show it. be a half of it. Mm, it can be narrower. Okay, I'll make it. Yeah, so, so first the no, introductions. Uh, uh, narrower and taller. Okay. Yeah, first introductions. So hello everyone. Uh, my name is Simo Tuomista. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a, um, can't remember the title now, but uh, probably systems designer or something like that <laughs> uh, in Alta University, where I work with uh, Aga HPC and uh, and help our users with various problems. And quite often these can be I/O related. Uh, so so I'm going to talk about talk a bit about data formats and how you should store your data uh, to make your analysis easier. Yeah. It's almost funny how often we have problems that are not about, like people know how to use CPU and memory pretty well, but the data IO, that's often pretty, uh, well, not great. Anyway, um, your screen, it can still be uh, taller, and also the font should be zoomed in some. Uh, do you want to have the terminal open there at the bottom? Mm. Or should I have it? So who's, am I, sh am I sharing my screen or are you sharing your screen for this part? Um, I'm currently sharing my screen, but uh, yeah, yeah if, if you want to like have the terminal open there as well, then. Uh, let's may, let's let you have the uh, yeah. screen share. Okay. Well, we can switch yeah. to me when it's time. Oh. Or, okay. okay. We did it now. Okay. Yeah. Let's do it now. So okay. Here so, we go. so yeah, yeah. like uh, first time uh, lecturing in this course, so so bit of a hiccup. Uh, but <laughs> let's let's start with like uh, while Richard is setting up our share. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's start talking about why why data formats are uh, important. So. Like data formats are something that you are using whenever you are using well any kinds of data really. Like uh, whether your data is uh, is something that um, uh, your store like using whenever you're using some sort of object, Python object or whatever, your mm -hmm. data is stored in some data format. So you're not you're even if you don't think about it, you're really using some data format uh, constantly, and. Mm -hmm. Is there a difference when, between data format? Well, maybe you're going to answer this soon, but on disk data format and in memory data format, and then the semantic data format. Uh, well, there is a, there is a, like a connection between them, and I will be talking about it in a second. So okay. basically, the idea is that like you will have some data format. Your data will be organized in some way, and uh, whenever your data is organized in some way. Uh, you'll want to have it in the disk in a similar way because that makes it easier to uh, work with. So if you, let's say you have a, like a bag of flour and you want to put it in, in the kitchen into your cupboard and you want to put it into a container, you don't want the container to be too big or too small mm -hmm. or the bag of flour, you want it to be the same kind of a container or like mm -hmm. container that will fit uh, whatever yeah. you have. So uh, you want it to be similar. So Maybe let's consider... have the right properties, like can it pour it well, or can you scoop it yeah. out efficiently yeah. without dumping yeah. everything? Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. So let's consider like the two most common data formats that we are have already used and what we are what you're most likely going to be using. So first of them is the da uh, is the data frame, uh, the pandas data frame that you have already used. Mm -hmm. So in the pandas data frame, we have the tidy format. 
and that is the data format of the tidy uh, well the data frame so we have these columns that each have a specific data type and the data is organized in these columns so we have a number of rows and then we have um, have the data organized as columns so richard do you want to run the uh, the commands that are uh, yeah. in that okay cell Let over me... there so just copy paste them Split into a notebook window. or somewhere okay. we can look at what what sort of a data what sort of a uh, data frame we get from that okay. for now i would recommend just following along uh, and later on we'll have an exercises where you can do the same thing basically uh, what, what richard is doing okay so let's see uh so this so, is a data frame. Yeah. So in this data frame, we have various different data formats uh, or data data columns. So we have uh, strings, we have timestamps, we have integers, and then we have floating point numbers. So we have, you can see from the info uh, command, the output of the info command, that the uh, data types for the different columns are different. So the data is organized in these specific different columns. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's uh, look at and, another example. And here columns yeah. are NumPy arrays. Yes. And these data yes. types are the NumPy data types. Yes. So basically okay. the data frame is, is this kind of like a like a holder for these various. So it's like uh, mm -hmm. if you have uh, uh, like utensils in your kitchen, you have uh, spoons, you have uh, forks, you have knives. They are all in the different uh, columns, mm -hmm. uh, in the different places in the in the utensils cabinet. Yeah. So okay. The data frame is basically like that. Mm -hmm. So let's look at another example uh, in the in the web page. So, so let's consider a NumPy array that is multi-dimensional. So for example, here we have like random numbers uh, that are oh. two dimensional. Maybe mm -hmm. you should uh, view the shape of the array. Like if you view the data array yeah, shape. shape. And size is yeah. that multiplied, yep. Yeah, so, so we have like currently over there, million random numbers that are organized in two dimensional like block. And this mm -hmm. is different to the pandas data frame because like in pandas, we had one dimensional columns and here we have two dimensional, um, two dimensional like a block. Mm -hmm. And even though like you can represent both of them as like, like a matrix, uh, the way that the computer stores them is different. Mm -hmm. And now we have a question that how yeah. Would we save these different data formats because they are fundamentally different uh, in files in a way that that keeps the data format intact? So basically, what we want to do is like if you are using some sort of like a, uh, if you're using tables, if you're using uh, NumPy ar arrays, you want to store them in a similar way. So here uh, at the bottom there we have a visualization of the NumPy array. So these yeah. Um, mm -hmm. The data is organized in this kind of a block of yeah. numbers. So I guess like here there's so pandas provides some useful mechanics for dealing with columns and rows separately, but it's deeper than that. So it's like you're saying that the actual arrangement in memory is numpy is optimized for array and pandas is optimized for column based things. So Yes, like, or or pandas is is not usually Pandas doesn't usually work that well if you're working with multi-dimensional data. Mm -hmm. Like uh, NumPy is uh, designed for this multi-dimensional num numeric data, but then again, pan uh, NumPy isn't that well uh, first if you're going to work with, let's say, strings or if you're going to be doing these kind of plottings mm -hmm. that we did mm -hmm. just yeah. right a bit previously. So okay. the NumPy is a uh, NumPy can support uh, these kinds of different type of data forms. Yeah. But the question okay. now is that, okay, we have data format. So we have either this array data. So this is common in like physics or 
if you're doing like uh, matrix calculations or something like that, linear mm -hmm. algebra, and you want to store stuff in these kinds of blocks. If you're a MATLAB user, you're very familiar with these kinds of stuff. Yeah. If I, 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 on the other side, we have this tidy data. And if you're like an R user, you might think of the R data, uh, data frames in the same way that mm -hmm. they're basically like, uh, like similar kinds of objects to the uh, pandas data frames. So we have this another type of data. Okay. So now you would want to choose a file format that keeps the data format intact. So you can store the data into a file so that, um, so that the, well, you, you can uh, return, return to it later on. Mm -hmm. And here it's important to remember one thing and that there is no good data format for every use case. Uh, so this is very important. So you shouldn't choose a data format before you know what data for, uh, sorry, you shouldn't choose a file uh, before you know what kind of data you're putting into the file. Okay. Instead, uh, usually mm -hmm. you have these various standard file formats and like this, um, this comic uh, shows the, the proliferation of these standards quite good, well. So, so basically, <laughs> yeah. usually you have 14 standards, then somebody thinks that, okay, they can unify the whole landscape. They can make one standard uh, that, that serves every use case. And in reality, there will be 15 standards. Yeah. So <laughs> this happens a lot in the IO world. So, so you will have multiple different file formats and it's all about finding the correct tools. Mm -hmm. And uh, usually when you want to choose a file format, you want to consider a few questions. So first off, is everybody else in your field using some data format uh, or file format? That is probably a good reason to use, well, the same tools yeah. that everybody else is using. Why not invent your own if everybody else has, has a good reason to use these? So basically standardization is more important than almost anything. Yes, practice. because then you, then you can utilize work that other people have already done. And mm -hmm. also you will uh, reduce the risk of creating like problems for yourselves in the further on, because like the data format most likely, uh, or the file format supports the work that you're going to be doing. Mm -hmm. Another good question is like, is it fast? Is it space sufficient? Is it easy to use for the use case that, that I'm going mm -hmm. to be doing? So then, when yeah. we talk about efficiency, is is this really a concern for small data? Do these considerations matter most when you have very large data? Or what do we yeah, think that, about this a, for small? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So most likely not. Or like, like you, when you have really small data, you don't notice these problems. Nowadays, like every laptop has an fast NVMe SSD or something like that, and it's it, the data loading will be so fast that you don't even notice it if you have small data. But mm -hmm. the, the thing is like the most, most of this talk is going to be like future proofing. Like uh, if at some point you're going to be working with the bigger data set, if at some point you're going to be working with data that other people provide, you might want to check a better, better data formats so that you know that you're not going to be, uh, well, encountering problems in the future yeah so so for example like uh if you if you have have some data format if you have some file format you still need to write something to plot let's say the data and whether this can like whether you have chosen a certain format and you can only plot from this format that can make mm -hmm. it harder for you yeah. to work with some other data format uh, later on and i think we we're going to see that it's easier to use good formats and good existing functions than make your own thing. So yes, that's like, and, yeah, I like the future proofing idea. So hmm. eventually something gets large and then better to do the right thing. Okay. Yeah, and, and here, here is an important thing to question yourself is that do you want the format to be human readable? So many of the data formats are human readable, but most of the efficient big data formats are not like they are binary formats. Mm -hmm. And the question is that, are you really looking at the data? Like, are you really looking at all of the columns? Like if we look at the NumPy array that you had there, like mm -hmm. nobody's going to be reading that as a text mm -hmm. file mm -hmm. because it's million 
billion numbers uh, in a text file and you will be uh, working with the data anyways using uh, like Jupyter notebooks like code you'll be accessing the stuff with the code anyways so is it really a benefit of having the data in a human readable format it's very enticing to use human readable formats because like you you always feel like you're in control like you can mm. you can read the format as well as the computer can but yeah. in reality like uh you might be shooting yourself into the foot yeah because like it might be better to just use the computer's way of reading the yeah. data instead of and i guess that's uh, probably instead. why people start with their own formats or bad formats when you start off because when you start off it's better to be able to understand it yes but then when you scale yes, this up this is not. exactly the case yeah yeah okay and yeah, then archival and, the, and, the, and sharing yeah the last question is that like there are different use cases for for data formats so you might want some data formats to be temporary data throughout your like analysis process and some data formats uh, that you want to like share with people so even though some formats might be good for like storing data uh, when when you share data they might not be good for temporary data formats and the other way around so you might want to uh, look at what part of your code you uh, are working on so you might want to choose a different format based on the uh, situation that you are mm -hmm. But let's look at, like, this is all theoretical and it's, it's getting boring. So let's look at some real world <laughs> okay. examples. So let's look at the most popular data formats. And the first one is like the most popular data format. So uh, comma separated values. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so yeah, what can you yeah, tell us about it? Yeah, well, CSV or comma separated values is, uh, is like a, uh, well, it's it's what it says. So you have basically some uh, data, numbers, strings, whatever, that are separated by, by some separator. Usually it's like a comma, like it says in the name, or it's a space or, or tablature or something like that, um, or, or tab. Uh, but, but basically you have uh, some text format that uh, forms this kind of a table, and then you have data in the table. Yeah. And this is very common for sharing data, especially like statistical data and stuff like that. But yeah. it's, it's very slow and very space inefficient. Mm -hmm. uh, but we still need to work with it because it's such a good format for sharing data because everybody mm -hmm. can understand it. Whatever yeah. program language they're using, they can understand it. Yeah. And I guess there's so no let's... risk that someone gets it in 50 years from now and then like i don't understand this like you just yeah, open it yeah. and you see the column names and yeah the biggest problem with csv is probably like if you have a, like a windows and linux or mac you have different line endings and you might have mm. different encodings mm -hmm. and stuff like that but but it's still like uh, it's very like you yeah. can still look at the file and understand that okay this is the file format yeah and you can like figure these problem problems out so should we do a demo yeah, so so we have already dataset. while working with the the Titanic dataset, we have already used the uh, the read CSV function. But let's uh, instead of like a reading a dataset in, let's take our already existing dataset and let's write it into a CSV file, and that is really easy. So we can we can write it well, like Richard has currently done. So uh, what we have. Is, is now a CSV file. So Richard is using this head function to to uh, from the check from the command line what what kind of stuff we have in the CSV yeah. file. Yeah. Is it just printing and the first four lines? Yes. So so over here we have set the index equals false so that uh, we don't have like this numbering index mm. at the front. But you can have it if you feel like it. I guess uh, that's because the index has no meaning here. Yeah. It's yeah. just an integer. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And we can recreate it, like enumerate it once we load mm -hmm. the data. So, so here we have the data similarly that we had. And, and the, the good thing about these functions, like the two CSV function that the Panda supplies is that, uh, it will create these standardized, uh, ways of writing the data. So mm -hmm. if you write data yourself, uh, with like, 
you open a file and then you write strings into it, uh, you can create like messy data that it, somebody else needs to like, then figure out how to read. But uh, pandas usually like the two CSV function creates these beautiful CSV files. Okay, let's let's read it back in. Okay, let's, let's look at the data. Mm -hmm. So for that, um, we will use the read CSV function. So it's very self-evident what it does. All of these functions, like the two CSV function and the read CSV function, they have lots of options that you can like. Let's say you have headers that are like uh, like comments somewhere at the start of the CSV file. You can skip those, and you can you can do all kinds of uh, stuff with the okay with the, the same. Uh, functions. Yeah, so we get the same data. Um, so this was for tidy data format. Okay, so this was because yeah. CSV is much better when working mm. with tidy data because mm. with tidy data it's like, well, it's uh, very easy to uh, understand it. With um, uh, like numeric data, if you have like a data array, it's a bit more complicated. Uh, mm. Not necessarily the writing part, but the uh, the reading part and everything like that can be later on a bit complicated. Yeah. So NumPy uh, has routines for saving and loading these CSV files. Um, so let's try writing this uh, data array. So there's this save txt uh, hmm. function. I guess this will print out a whole lot because the first lines are very long. Yeah, yeah. Should I do it? And that is. Let's uh, try it. Yeah, let's try. Uh, uh, you have a typo. Uh, array. Okay. But yeah, that the and this this brings the problem why like why it's not very useful format for for this. Uh, this kind of a, uh, uh, well data type because like you're not going to be reading this data like you're not going to be like. Human, humanly read this data. And especially if the data is multidimensional, uh, like larger mm -hmm. than two dimensional, it becomes really hard to like yeah. pass the data. Mm -hmm. But uh, nevertheless, we can load this kind of data in. So let's try the, uh, the load txt okay. function to, to load see. the data. So, so for, for numeric data, this isn't definitely isn't the best way of working with the data. Yeah, OK, so it works. Yeah, so it works. Yeah. Um, there's one additional thing that is like additional complication when you have text data, and that is that the floating point precision uh, can easily be like uh, reduced. So uh, for example, like if you have data in NumPy arrays, you usually have like these uh, double precision numbers, so these float 64 numbers mm -hmm. that have about 16 decimal places of precision. Mm -hmm. But if you use like normal Python, like uh, to write these numbers, you can easily lose some of that precision. So uh, if you look at the example there, where, there we like create like a square root of two, number of mm -hmm. square root of two, we write that into a CSV file using like normal Python routines, like we would just like these these kind of stuff that you see all the time uh, when when you're like just doing something quick and dirty. So basically, you open a file, you write something to the file, and then you um, close the file. And when you read it back from the file, uh, the data is not the same. So can you can you show like what is the test number mm -hmm. and uh, what is the head of the CSV file? Okay. And then mm, So the test yeah. number is it's like written. has 16 decimals like but when you write write with with the well, when you write, like, like uh, you can easily uh, mess it up. And the reason here why it messes up it, is that it's in the writing part where there's this floating point, uh, like percent %f, uh, like 
shorthand for floating point and there's no mention of what is the uh, what is the precision that we want to write in and the default precision is something like six decimals and these yeah. can easily like create problems and that that's why usually when you're dealing with numeric data uh, and and the precision is important like physical simulations or, so, or something like that you want to store the binary data because then you can have its exact same numbers mm -hmm. represented mm -hmm. when you load the data back in so yeah. of course in many cases like having 60 decimals of precision isn't necessary if you have like measurement data from like i don't know questionnaires or something but yeah <laughs> like <laughs> uh mm -hmm. yeah, yeah but, like, but in feeling... many cases it might be important and that's why like yeah. using these uh csv files can be a bit risky yeah. I have a feeling for very numerical intensive simulations with high precision. This is a whole art of dealing with numerical yeah. precision, but most people yeah, don't need to deal with that. Additional problem with the CSV file is that you need huge number of characters to write one of these numbers. You need 16 decimals of characters to write one of these numbers. So, <laughs> so what you usually want to do is use to be a binary data because that is yeah. much more space efficient. It's like, what? okay, let's, yeah. Okay, let's so, move forward to to actual binary formats. So, what what are alternatives to the CSV? Because CSV is the most popular and it's so easy to use, uh, but there are ma many alternatives nowadays that are re really good at uh, like working is that you can work with instead of uh, using the um, CSV files. Mm -hmm. Like the CSV files are nothing nothing bad, but they are not best format for every use. So let's consider this feather format. Okay. So feather format, you can, it's a, it's a format, it was developed by the developers of, uh, of well, the main developer of Pandas and the um, main developer of this tidyverse in R. So this Hadley Wickham and, and the, well, I can't remember the Pandas guy now, but, uh, Basically, they developed the format so that they could share data frames between R and Pandas more easily. And uh, you can try installing this format yourself with this pp install py arrow. We'll talk about package installing later on, but for using this, you will need this extra package. Mm -hmm. Okay. And and better format is basically only for tidy data. It's very efficient, space-wise, very fast. And it's great for tidy data, but it it's not great for um, anything else. So it, it's very like one one note, but it's really good at what it does, uh, and you should use it for tho those cases. And the best usage for it is to have like temporary storage of your data frame. Like if you have data frame, you're working on it, save it as a feather. That's most likely going to be fine unless the data frame has some really strange Python object. But if it's like strings, numbers, stuff like that, better is really good. And it has uh, interfaces to, well, like I mentioned, at least Python R and Julia. Mm -hmm. And Pandas has really good integration with these, many of these formats. So you have, similarly to the two CSV, you have this two feather, and it's very self-evident how it works. Yeah, so I'm showing it here, and we see we can save it and reread it, and it looks exactly like the other one. It has the same date time objects, ints objects, which actually I think if we go back up to the CSV reading, it probably doesn't have that. Well, the CSV reader uh, it ha probably has, but but that's because like the CSV reader will convert the da data formats, but like. Yeah, it's it's more complicated usually to um, like it, it like needs here. to interpret the object. Oh, yeah. actually, yeah, that's like true. here the timestamps, yeah. it doesn't recognize them as actual times. It thinks they're strings. Yeah, that's that's and actually a really good point. I that. didn't. I'm, yeah, I, I thought it would convert them, but okay. It yeah. didn't. So you there's op Yeah, there's yeah. options in the CSV reader that will. Um, convert it for you. You say this column will be a date time and so on. But this is one of the advantage of using these good formats. Like it has all the metadata about the type. So you don't have to deal with converting columns and this and that and 
oh, this column has nuns or something. It's always the same. Mm. Yeah, um, yeah, that's yeah, that's a good, re really good point. Yeah. So header is like this quick and dirty format for like storing temporary data, but there are other formats for tidy data as well. So this part of care format that is mm -hmm. part of the same pi arrow package that mm -hmm. the better format is. That's like the big data format. It's designed by by Apache Hadoop. So it's the backend format of many of these like really big end uh, uh, data farms. And uh, it's it's meant for tidy data, but it can house binary data, but it's complicated. So we are not going to go into that. Uh, if you want to have a demonstration of that uh, today, I will be having a talk <laughs> in Nordic RSC where I'll demo a use case of this parquet mm -hmm. for binary data. But uh, it's it's really good also for uh, like tidy st just storing tidy data. So. Uh, Pandas has similar for functions for Parquet as, as it uh, did for Feather and uh, CSV. So you just just do the same. <laughs> it's like there's mm -hmm. not that many demos that we can give of these formats because like you the interfaces are all the same. Uh, yeah. So it's not a really a big hassle to start using these formats. You just mm -hmm. like you change the name of the function and you can use the format. Wait, so can and you this, clarify? This, What's yeah. the difference between when, when would you use Feather instead of Parquet and vice versa? Well, the Feather is is like really fast for really big CSV tables. So mm -hmm. instead of like having really big CSV tables, you would have these uh, Feather okay. tables. So it, it's like if you just want something to be done really fast, mm -hmm. that's probably the easiest yeah. option. Uh, Parquet is also very fast, and it's it's like a lot more well it's better for archival because it's been used yeah. for archival and so, it's uh so so i would say that part okay in general is is the better format but but feather might be good for if you just want mm -hmm. something to do be done fast is it something Especially, like yeah. feather is closer to the memory representation and parquet is a separate format for storing to disk yes or... so so feather is is pretty much like store it as as it is in memory and okay. uh, mm -hmm. and part of case is a bit more like like do some extra steps yeah. in the way but but both of them are really good like mm -hmm. you can use either one uh it depends on the on the use case yeah like uh, okay. uh yeah but but part of case is very like well well shared so there's interfaces yeah. for matlab and other languages as well yeah okay but okay, so Parquet is complicated for objects like these kind of block formats, like if you want to store num numbers. So mm -hmm. for that, HDF5 is uh, much better. So HDF5, also known as like hierarchical data format. So th this is very good for storing array data. Like if you have uh, like big blocks of data that you want to store. You can, in Pandas, there's also this interface called PyTables that allows you to store these tables into HDF5 as well. But that's usually not that efficient because the problem is that like a lot of this data in these data frames is, is usually strings and HDF5 isn't that mm -hmm. good with strings. Uh, it's better with numeric data. So yeah. usually you, the file sizes can get a big bit bigger if you have string data but mm -hmm. if you have numeric data hcf5 is really good yeah okay should we do a demo yeah let's do a demo so, so we're doing the tidy data data set yeah. first so that is pretty much the same as the, the other ones uh it, it just does the uh, same thing i just realized we have five minutes left so yeah maybe okay. we can let's, summarize better yeah okay so it loads yeah. Mm. And there's a separate package to use for yes. um yes. the so, arrays. Yeah, for which... array data you want to use this HDF5 uh like H5Pi mm -hmm. uh sorry package that is yeah. really nice and really good that you can use to to work with these data sets. Okay, yeah. Um I'll so... quickly summarize netcdf4. We don't really need to maybe go through the demo. Uh, but netcdf4 is this kind of like 
HDF5, but organized. So, so you can have like multiple data sets within that one data file. Mm -hmm. So you can have like, like, let's say you have physical simulation and you have, or let's say like a weather simulation and you have mm -hmm. like a grid of points that represent the weather at different locations uh, around the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can store, let's say, multiple data sets with one data set being like temperature, or other data set being a pressure, and all of them can be like huge matrices mm -hmm. uh, or huge arrays of numbers. And the NetCDF 4 has this kind of like organized way of storing this data. So you can lo load them into various different like programs. And uh, yeah, that is something that uh, like if you're going to be working with these kinds of data, that might be a format for you. There's demo there. We don't have time to go through it, unfortunately, but it's it's not nothing really special. Yeah. Uh, it uses this X array packet that is really nice for working with this kind of data. Is NetCDF uh, one of these database kind of things somehow? Uh, or no, not really. So it's it's basically like it's like a, it's just like HDF five, but it just has like internal like uh, everybody has agreed to certain rules of naming the data sets, and yeah. that's why it works. Okay, okay. And the last but not least, NumPy. we have NumPy data format. So if all of those previous data formats for this like array data looked complicated, uh, you can use this NumPy array data format. So this is really easy. So <laughs> this is something that uh, works really well. So you can have this, uh, you can use this NumPy save function to store an array into uh, into um, mm -hmm. yeah, you can store an array into into this NumPy format, and there's also this save Z function that you can store multiple arrays into one of these, and and this is really good for like quick and dirty uh, storage of NumPy arrays instead of like CSV files. You can just use those. Mm -hmm. And uh, but it's not very good for sharing necessarily data. So for that, I, I would still recommend NetCDF or HDF five. But it's it's really good format, a anyways. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think uh, maybe we, we can, can leave, uh, we leave the exercises as homework. Is there yeah, let's, let's, much to? Well, I yeah, guess it's basically yeah. doing what we did above. Yeah, so yeah, so so yeah. the exercises are left for homework. So they're basically like. Do the same thing. The, in the in the page itself, there's also information of like why you should use binary formats. So there's benchmarks, quick mention of like how how mm -hmm. these different formats uh, pair with each other. And the main question is like the scaling and the future future proofing. Mm -hmm. Like if you you know that if you know that you're always going to be working with small data, then not nothing of what I've said really matters. <laughs> like, like you can just use CSV if you know that you will always be using like megabytes of data. But if any point you feel like you'll be working with something bigger than that, you really should look into like a correct data, a good data format for your use case, and and use mm -hmm. that to store the data. Uh, and there are various benefits, like mentioned here. For binary formats, and uh, they they can really help you out. Uh, but but remember that there is no correct data format. Like mm -hmm. that is the most important thing to remember. And you really should look into what other people are doing around you, because like data is all about sharing, and it's it's all about like like uh, mm -hmm. moving information around, and and like you really should be using those formats that other people in your field are using because mm -hmm. that makes it easy to share not only the uh, the data itself but also the ways of interacting with the data like plotting yeah. the data mm -hmm. reading the data in like that kind of stuff and uh, yeah usually you there's a few questions here that you can ask yourself uh, what 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 the data should um, uh, yeah. what you should think about mm -hmm. when you're choosing the data yeah, okay. unfortunately, this uh, this talk is a bit less interactive than the other talks, but yeah. I hope you 
get something out of it. Yeah, so, okay, so that's our time. Maybe we can stick around a bit after a... Um, we can mention uh, that one format I forgot to add here is that NumPy also supports math formats. So if you are using MATLAB, as many of the users seem to be, uh, NumPy can read the math formats mm -hmm. also. Just to mention yeah. like this in the NumPy IO pages, you can look, look it up. Yeah. So in HackMD, okay, should we continue with the, um, any other discussions? So one thing I was wondering was what about SQLite or these on disk database formats? Does that have any role in anything? Yes. Yes, so SKLite and, and various SK databases, they are very popular when you have something that creates a lot of new data constantly, like you create new rows of data. Uh, so when you have de data that you can, like um, uh, you have a something that that like iterates over and over, let's say like a, like a um, Markov process of some, something like that, that basically like you have a state and then you get another state and another state, uh, you want to add new rows of data, uh, then SKL is very good, or SKLite mm -hmm. is very good because each row, adding new rows is very fast in, in SKL. But also like if you have data that you can use the SKL uh, lookup, like the mm -hmm. select functions mm -hmm. to, to look into or, or merge tables based on some stuff, yeah. it's, it's very good for that as well. I think once I said something like if what the data you're using can be, if you can export your analysis to do it in the database engine so it returns only what you need and efficiently uses those index and gets a small amount of data, it's good. But not like if you're storing a whole data frame and every time you read it, you'll read the whole thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, like, yeah, Every, everything has its use case, but it's like, there's no, like, uh, there's no one uh, use case for all, like, all formats are not supported by every mm -hmm. um, data format of a file format. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I wanted to give a comment on the data formats. Really nice lecture. And uh, something I did in my past was to invent my own data formats, and I regret that now. So I, <laughs> I think it's really there is point to, to go for standard data formats, even if they are not like a hundred percent fit. If it if it's like an okay mm -hmm. enough fit, now I would be very careful about inventing my own format, and I would rather try to adapt to whatever is standard and existing in my community. So that was a really good point there. Yeah, yeah, like I I have done it myself previously as well and i regret it as well it's because like then after people start using your format or like using the tools you have created for that uh, specific type of format you uh, realize at some point that you it's harder to harder and harder to like re-implement it again with some better uh, tools yeah so and then you need to write uh, tools to read it to write it and the nice thing about the standard data format is that you don't have to write any of that. It's, it's a one-line thing. Just read it in and write it out. You don't have to program this. And it's a bit of, a, bit of a boring task to to program functions that write out your data into some other data format. Mm. Yeah, and I, I think like everybody writes, I don't know, like maybe maybe a hundred CSV readers throughout their like programming lifetime at least. Like I yeah. have probably written I've written and read like like instead of using like this already existing stuff, it's like, okay, I'll, I'll just do it fast and dirty. Like I'll create a CSV reader here. And then, then at some point you realize that, okay, I need to add features here. And, and then, uh, then you think that why shouldn't, why wouldn't I <laughs> yeah. use the CSV readers available in these, uh, oh. the packages already. And, and yeah, that, that kind of like, uh, how hard can it be? Attitude can can really make it hard for you, <laughs> yeah. hard for you because like it is actually it can be quite hard and uh, yeah it, it can save you a lot of effort and a lot of time if you uh, just trust in other people basically like trust in somebody mm -hmm. some engineer somewhere has designed these data formats yeah. because they have encountered problems that you are dealing with. 
and they wanted to solve them and somebody paid them a lot of money probably to solve them so yeah. uh, you don't have the resources to to do the same work so yeah i what? think one one thing i remembered earlier i wanted to mention was this uh what idea of uh like structural versus semantic storage so for example you wouldn't want to write your own binary format almost ever but in several of my projects we're using say the feather format or sqlite format or something and our format is basically saying r in the feather save it will have columns of these names so my data format is choosing the standard column names and then use the standard structural format for either in memory or on disk that is and actually a very good point very good point so and then you know then it's also easy to switch out the back end as long as it loads to the same semantic format later hmm. and then yeah, and, and, yeah. Yeah, I w wanted to just say that, like, in when it comes to like data accessing and data formats and data, all of the, all of this, what is usually important is that the uh, what you can do with it. Like, basically, if you the most more important talk in this today today was the pandas talk and the plotting talk, but in order for those to be like to 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 like facilitate those, you usually need to load the data in mm -hmm. or save the data out somewhere. So, so in order to be able to do the plotting and do the analysis of your data, you usually need to like have the data somewhere. And it, mm -hmm. it, like, it might seem trivial that okay, like I have like a few megabytes of CSV. Why, why does, why would I care? But if if you like make it a thousand times bigger, like once you start getting to the gigabyte range, then like you don't want to wait three minutes for your data to load mm -hmm. so that you can do a plot. Like that's mm -hmm. that's when you can do it like in, let's say in a few seconds with better data formats. So the, then, like it it really interferes with these other things that you you really want to do. There. Like basically, I/O is is usually this kind of like a waiting screen uh, or loading screen of of the HPC world. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. you don't ever want to be at loading screen with your computer like because that doesn't feel productive you're not doing anything you're just waiting for it to do something and io is basically that and mm -hmm. by using these better data formats you can minimize the waiting time for this other stuff that is actually important mm -hmm. and and that's why why uh, choosing good data formats is usually really good because then you can just like yeah you can um and using frameworks that support these data for, formats, mm -hmm. for example, Pandas and, and many, many other uh, languages have uh, similar functions. So that like using these will save you a lot of time to do the other things that are more important. Mm -hmm. Yeah.